the speaker. Members, so on behalf of uh, the member for the Pilbara, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, students here from Bainton Primary School. So it's lovely to have them in the gallery here today. Uh, are there any questions? The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, I refer to reports of staff walking off site in protest of chronic staff shortages and unsafe working conditions at South Headland Hospital and ask. Can the minister explain what has led to the staff uh, leaving due to these chronic shortages and unsafe conditions? The Minister for Health. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm advised that there's a range of issues which, uh, which were uh, raised by healthcare workers, um, primarily uh, employees or members of the United Workers' Union regarding support services staff at Headland Hospital. Um, we have since broke, proactively reached out to United Workers' Union to discuss the situation and I want to assure the community we take all staff feedback very seriously and listen to any concerns carefully and compassionately. Um, I, I think there are concerns right throughout uh, the regional health services, Madam Speaker, as they struggle with um, to attract the staff that they need, and I understand that it puts them under pressure, and it puts them under pressure at a time when they've been doing a magnificent job uh, keeping Western Australians safe during our COVID-19 experience. Uh, so, Madam Speaker, this is an issue for the WA Country Health Service to sort, and I understand they are on top of it. Supplementary question. Uh, supplementary question. Minister, isn't this just another example of your inability to properly manage your portfolio, leading to this first walk out of the Headland Hospital since 2004? Minister for Health. No. The member for Netherlands. To the McGowan Labor government's commitment to putting patients first through its significant investment in hospitals and health infrastructure through Western Australia, and I ask. Can the Premier outline to the House what the McGowan Labor government's investment in a new women and babies hospital will mean for West Australian mothers and their newborns? And can the Premier advise how it is only through this government's strong financial management that this important investment can be made? Premier. Speaker, can I also welcome the students from Bainton West Primary School who are here today on behalf of the uh, member for Pilbara. Can I thank the member for Nedlis? Uh, for the question, and it's true, uh, this government has done more for Netherlands than any, any government in history with Bob Hall College. Bob Hall College uh, and uh, the expansion of Bob Hall College, uh, and also uh, the new Women's and Babies Hospital uh, that we are building uh, in Netherlands, uh, Madam Speaker. So, uh, King Edwards has been there for more than 100 years. Uh, obviously, it's uh, it's uh, done a wonderful job over that period of time, uh, but it's, uh, it's rapidly ageing, uh, and so we want to and will be providing a new uh, women's and babies hospital for the people of both the city and the country in this state. Uh, we committed uh, $3.3 million towards the project in the 1920 budget for preliminary planning. Uh, we've worked out that the preferred site uh, is at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital, north of G Block. Uh, just uh, near the QE2 site, uh, and the new hospital will be Western Australia's only maternity, maternity and gynaecological uh, hospital, uh, which also includes obstetric and birthing suites, as well as a full range of specialist uh, services. Uh, it will be a centre of excellence for Western Australian mothers and newborns, uh, and I would expect the best women's and babies hospital, not just in Australia, but also in the world. Yeah, yeah. It will be very impressive. Uh, we're working on uh, the designs and scope of work, uh, follow, following the detailed business case and project definition plan that are being worked through now. Uh, we expect work to get underway in 2023. Uh, we'll be declaring the hospital a strategic project under the West Australian Jobs Act to ma maximise uh, local content, and we expect it will, it will create 1,400 uh, local jobs uh, during uh, construction. Uh, we're able to do this because of good financial management over the last four and a half years. Uh, and uh, we will, uh, as you'll see in the budget, there will be $1.8 billion uh, invested uh, in this uh, project, uh, a fully funding or fully funded project uh, that will provide support for uh, families all over the state. 
What's great about the Women's and Babies Hospital is it just doesn't serve the metro metropolitan area. It serves women and children from all over uh, Western Australia and be in proximity to the other health services uh, on that site, obviously in Netherlands in the heart of the city, uh, but near public transport and obviously accessible uh, for people uh, all over the state. The great thing is, Madam Speaker, is we've managed to finance as well, which means we're able to do this. I do note uh, that in, on the final Thursday of the election campaign, uh, when the Liberal Party released their costings, uh, which we all remember, uh, with, uh, with, the, uh, with the former member for Churchlands and the um, and the member for Cottesloe, were yelling at uh, journalists uh, on that occasion. Uh, the uh, the Liberal Party, as part of their costings, allocated three million dollars towards this project, uh, Madam Speaker. So uh, we've allocated 1.8 billion. That's because we managed to finance as well, uh, and we're able to set the state up for the future, which, which is what this project is. The member for North West Central. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Tourism. Minister, I refer to the latest report by Tourism WA on vi uh, vitalisation, uh, visitation, sorry, to Western Australia overview year ending March 2021, which showed WA Tourism had lost $3.3 billion and declined by 39 per cent since the onset of COVID-19. And the recent business survey conducted by Tourism Council WA that reveals almost one in three tourism businesses have reported they will run out of cash reserves in six months and face closure due to COVID-19 related restrictions, both here in WA and interstate. And I ask, one, will your government provide further relief this financial year from fees collected from tourism related businesses, which are significantly impacted by these restrictions and if not, why not? Thank the, uh, I thank the member for his question. Uh, I, sorry, know, I haven't given you the call um, yet, Minister for uh, Tourism. Uh, Minister if, if for Tourism, I haven't given you the call yet because I was just waiting for the other people who wanted to answer the question to uh, be quiet. Um, Minister for Tourism. Uh, our government has, uh, of course, great sympathy, sympathy for any businesses that are affected by uh, COVID-19. But where else would you be in Australia than Western Australia? Exactly. The simple fact is this. The simple fact is this. Uh, the uh, uh, sad, uh, sad failures uh, that we see uh, over in the eastern seaboard, particularly in New South Wales, uh, uh, is a stark uh, example of what happens when you don't act swiftly, when you don't respond quickly as this government has consistently done since the COVID-19 situation faced the nation. And it is very interesting, it is very interesting to see that uh, we have uh, now uh, not only the most robust economy in uh, Australia, but also in the nation, consumer confidence at some of its highest levels ever. And we have uh, un uh, unemployment rates, again, uh, low, uh, unlike other uh, parts of the nation, and we have people uh, in Western Australia currently, because of the strong border policy of this government and this Premier, uh, seeing Western Australians able to move throughout the state, able to experience the magnificent tourism opportunities and tourism uh, uh, um, uh, 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 offers throughout the state of Western Australia. And they have done that in their Thousands. Western Australians are travelling more and more since the Wander Out Yonder campaign that was launched last year. We have seen now Western Australians exploring places that many of them have never been to. Many of them never been to. And we know that there are uh, a number of uh, businesses, be they accommodation providers, be they uh, tourism experiences, uh, that of course have seen numbers uh, unlike any other in the past. We know that when borders are uh, have to be closed. Of course, that impacts on inbound, uh, inbound visitors from the eastern states. We recognise that. And one of the places that particularly is impacted by that member, as you may be aware, is indeed Perth City itself. And so our hotels in, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Perth in particular, particularly midweek, have been impacted. So this government has responded consistently, talking to the industry, talking to the sector, and responding when necessary. And look, there's a whole range, a whole list of initiatives that this government has put in place and responded to to assist and support when there are, there are, there are uh, uh, troughs in some parts of the market. But goodness gracious me, look across to the border. Look at New South Wales, and if you're a tourism operator in New South Wales, you can't do anything. 
You can't do anything at all. Nothing. And yet we know that in Western Australia there are businesses that are uh, doing, doing well. And those that are not have been supported by campaigns in the North West, uh, campaigns supporting uh, at, at, um, air, t air ticket uh, subsidies, uh, campaigns for experience subsidies in the Kimberley, uh, experiences uh, with the, uh, uh, the Look and Read Book uh, campaign, which was launched specifically to backfill uh, uh, accommodation uh, uh, cancellations from, the, north, uh, from the, uh, the eastern seaboard. The government is responding consistently to these things, and we will keep on doing that. In Kalbarri, uh, 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 the, we, we launched a campaign to uh, ensure that people are reminded that Kalbarri is now open for business. And we've got also a campaign that it will support people uh, to uh, allow some subsidies for experiences there. The government is responding consistently to the market. But remember this, we are in the best position than any other state and territory in Australia. And it gives us an opportunity to sell the state to our own population as we are doing, and they are responding in their, in their hundreds of thousands and getting out into the industries. But it also allows us to ensure that when we are able to open the borders safely, obviously to interstate and then uh, to international uh, visitation, we will have uh, we will be a place of uh, a destination for many of those people because we know we have a whole suite of experiences, landscapes, cultural and arts experiences to share with the rest of the world when we're able to open. The problem with you, member, is you keep talking down the state. You keep talking down the state. And it's what you and it's what you and your dwindled members on the other side consistently do. This state is the safest in the nation and one of the safest places in the world. We'll keep on honing our story for when we can welcome visitors back from the eastern states and overseas, but we'll also keep encouraging Western Australians to travel within their own state. They're doing that, and I want them to keep on, uh, while they're doing that, to purchase uh, experiences while they're in those, uh, those places so that they support the tourism industry going forward. You keep talking down the state, and I tell you what, it does you a great disservice and it certainly doesn't instil confidence in people who need confidence in, in how well Western Australia is doing. The yeah, supplementary question to the Minister for North West Central, Minister, a member for North West Central. Minister, if your government will not agree to provide further relief to these businesses, does it mean that you're happy for them to go out of business, costing jobs, causing experienced operators to exit the industry? Well, I'll tell you what we won't do. I'll tell Minister you what we won't do. for Unlike Tourism. You, we won't stand with Clive Palmer and start attacking this uh, and, and start attacking the state no. as you have done and your people have done over the time. We won't stand with Clive Palmer. We stand against him, mate. We stand against him. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because you and your side of politics, your side of politics, consistently, 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 consistently won't, won't, uh, won't condemn Clive Palmer. I haven't heard you con condemn Clive Palmer ever. Because you're in pocket. You're a puppet. You're a puppet of Clive Palmer. And you'll continue to be. And I'll tell you what, I keep talking at the, the tourism industry. The, uh, it's a brilliant industry. Minister for Tourism. If I could. Uh, ask you to come back to the question, please, and perhaps uh, address your comments to the chair, and I'll ask the member for North West Central not to continuously interject. I think you've made your point by way of interjection, and perhaps we can just hear the remainder of uh, the rather brief answer that you're about to give. We'll make sure, Madam Speaker, can I assure you of this? We'll make sure that our border policy is the strongest in the nation, that it protects Western Australians, it protects businesses in Western Australia so that they actually can continue to do business. And many of them are doing very, very well in business because of our strong, strong border policy. But we won't be a puppet to Clive Palmer like the member for North West Coastal. We won't be a puppet to Palmer like he is, nor him and the National Party. We'll keep the state safe. We'll keep the state safe. And I tell you what, I'd rather be here in Western Australia than because we've seen what happens when you don't act swiftly and you don't do things in, in support and ensure the safety and well-being of your own state's population. The member for Chandicott. Madam, Madam Speaker, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have a very important question to the Minister for Health. Minister, 
I refer to the McGowan Labour government's commitment to meeting the unprecedented levels of demand facing Western Australia's emergency departments. And I ask, can the Minister update the House on how the McGowan Labour government's $1.9 billion investment, I repeat, $1.9 billion investment in our health systems will ease the pressure on the West Australian emergency departments and ensure world-class care can continue to be delivered. Madam the, Speaker. The Minister for Health. Madam Speaker, I thank the member for the question. And before I do answer the member um, about this important question, Madam Speaker, I hope you'll indulge me just briefly to say uh, this morning I went as the member for Cronana and representing the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. I attended the funeral of Mrs Theresa Wally, uh, who'd been known to many in the parliament, Madam Absolutely. Speaker. Um, um, Mrs Wally was uh, one of the great elders of the southwest of Western Australia. Uh, a, a member of the stolen generation who went on to grow a, a huge, uh, thriving family, but also was a stalwart and a great advocate for the Noongar community. And I just wanted to put yeah. on, on the record my, my condolences to her family and thanks for her. Um, and Madam Speaker, um, it's a very important question, and we know that our emergency departments are under unprecedented pressure at the moment. And um, and for a lot of and for a lot of. Um, uh, our, our healthcare work, frontline healthcare workers, uh, they're doing it tough at the moment. Uh, we are seeing a post-COVID spike in relation to hospital demand. And although those opposite are, are, are in denial with around, around these things, Madam Speaker, I just want to quote briefly Dr Sean Stevens, the chair of the WA faculty of the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners. Where yesterday on Channel 9 he said they, the Premier and, and Health Minister, are actually quite true. We did see a period during the pandemic where, for a range of reasons, people didn't see their GP for their regular prevention, preventative health. And it just shows the importance of having regular preventative health checks because now we are seeing some of the effects of this delayed diagnosis and treatment. And Madam Speaker, that's the reason why we have such peaks at the moment in triage ones and triage twos, and to a lesser extent triage threes in our EDs, and why our hospitals are under particular pressure. So, Madam Speaker, I'm particularly proud of the $1.9 billion commitment from the McGowan government to healthcare, uh, which is committed to putting patients first. And part of that plan, uh, Madam Speaker, is to assist the emergency departments and the staffs, the staff that work there. Perth CDs will be receiving a massive $100 million funding injection as part of the upcoming state budget, which will see an additional 50 staff, full-time equivalent staff employed, including um, uh, medical, nursing, allied health and support services. It is designed to improve patient flow, reduce uh, bed block and relieve ambulance con congestion and, of course, Madam Speaker, improve health outcomes for, for WA patients. We're also pleased to announce plans uh, whilst touring the virtual emergency medicine system at Fiona Stanley Hospital uh, on Monday, which during the first month of this pilot successfully reduced ramping or diverted 25 per cent of ambulances away from EDs. This is a system which works, Madam Speaker, by having a, a teleconference call uh, with the uh, paramedics and the patient in the ambulance before they get to the ED so that they may be diverted, if, if possible, to ambulatory care or go straight to an, a medical imaging uh, 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 department for, uh, for diagnostic attention, uh, which of itself obviously provides a very innovative and, and clever way of reducing congestion in our EDs. A $2.3 million boost to this uh, cutting-edge system will, will be expanded to Rockingham and Peel Hospital, and we look forward to seeing it flow through to other EDs. We have also committed $4.8 billion to boost the Perth Children's Hospital Emergency Department to employ an additional 16 nurses, Madam Speaker, which will allow an additional nurse on every shift to be based in the ED waiting area to monitor patients. This $100 million package includes $61.6 million to, to mental health, including $7.9 million for child and adolescent mental health services, at the construction of two mental health emergency centres at Rockingham and Armidale Hospitals, new multiple multidisciplinary team pilots are called active recovery teams based at a range of hospitals across Perth and regional uh, hospitals and an expansion of the adult 
community treatment services that support people with mental health uh, issues as they come out of a hospital environment. Madam Speaker, the, um, the reasons for the, uh, for the increased pressure on our hospital are multifactorial, and that's why we've brought a multifactorial response sponsored by a $1.9 billion, $1 billion boost to healthcare services in Western Australia, and is another example Madam Speaker, of how the McGowan government is putting patients first. The Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> My question is to the Minister for Energy. Minister, I refer to your response on Tuesday in question time regarding the hardship provisions offered to, by, uh, by Synergy to customers in the Swiss. And I ask, in July, why did Horizon Power disconnect 606 re regional electricity customers which is 20 times the rate on a per customer basis of Synergy's disconnections of 587 disconnections in the same month. This was during the coldest and wettest month of the year. Minister for Energy. So Horizon Power manages its disconnections very carefully. Because it has advanced metering infrastructure, it can disconnect and reconnect a customer instantaneously. So whilst it does uh, disconnect a higher proportion of customers, it's able to reconnect them much faster. In the southwest interconnected system, because there are not advanced metering infrastructure, they, uh, you actually have to have a physical disconnection with an electrician going from Western Power to site. In addition to that, Horizon Power also has uh, prepaid metres they have a, a specific arrangement that was entered into during the former government that allows them to use prepaid metres. That's not available to uh, Synergy. Those prepaid metres are in uh, Indigenous communities. And uh, when a person doesn't top up their prepaid metre, that's still a disconnection. So the reason that there's a higher rate is because they have completely different systems. In the, in the southwest interconnected system, Synergy is making a deliberate effort to uh, work with customers to manage debts in a new and innovative way that I re reported it the other day. And unlike you, Member, I, I welcome Synergy's work. I don't think, as you said, that it's a, that it's a what was the word you used on radio? Uh, Appalling, I think you said. Um, I can't remember the so exact word. So did you word. care for people in need? Uh, no, you said, no, you said, said that it was appalling that the government the wasn't sum sending was debt collectors in to collect this money. Said you should no, help people you, in need. You can't have this both ways. 82.6 per cent increase in disconnections during the period of the last government uh, and attacking us for being reasonable in the way that Synergy behaves in its disconnections uh, procedures. You can't have this both ways. You have to choose one side of the street to walk on. You can't, uh, you can't continue to behave in this irresponsible manner. Speaker, supplementary su question. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Minister, given that historically and in previous months the disconnection disparity between Synergy and Horizon is around four times, how do you account for, for the, the rate of disconnection being 20 times in the month of July? July? It cannot be for the reasons that you have given. Minister well, for Energy. Well, uh, if, you, if, you, if you know the answer to the question, why don't you provide it to me? Why don't you? You're well, the minister. You know, I have provided the answer. The historic to the average is four times since the, 19. As you In know, July, it was 20 times. As you know, there was a moratorium on disconnections that expired on the 30th of June. The companies have, have uh, engaged with their local communities at my direction to make sure that uh, when disconnection practices recommenced, that they would not be done uh, to, as a surprise to any of the communities. Uh, I understand there's 563 residential customers had been disconnected in the first month of disconnections by Horizon. Uh, and it's true, that's more than uh, Synergy did. Uh, but as I say, that, that 563 by the, by the 26th of July, member, um, uh, as I say, the, there's a range of reasons for that. One of those is that, that prepaid metres were not being disconnected. So you understand what I'm saying here. Those metres, that was a system that your government introduced. I supported it when it was introduced. They put prepaid metres into Aboriginal communities. So they didn't have to pay and they kept their electricity. But once the 30th of June... 
I mean, you really need to listen and not talk. This is one of your problems. You're very happy to talk and not listen. Now it's your turn to listen and not talk. Let me make... No, I was not asking you a question. I'm making a point to you and you need to listen and not talk. What I said to you was that those prepaid metres continued to provide electricity during the period of time where there was a disconnection moratorium. But those prepaid metres after the 30th of June could not get electricity because they did not have payments made. So they were disconnected. <clears throat> so I, I, exactly what I said to you is true. Horizon has a different set of procedures. Sure. The average disconnection period for Horizon is less than one hour. The, you cannot reconnect a Synergy customer in less than one day. This so they are completely the different practices. The member for Mirabuka. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Planning. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's efforts to drive greater investment in our economy that supports local jobs and local businesses. And I ask, can the Minister outline to the House on what this government's efforts to cut red tape and support our economic recovery through the State Development Assessment Unit has meant for local workers and local businesses? And can the Minister advise the House if she is aware of anyone who opposes these efforts to support local jobs? Thank the you. Minister for Planning. Thank you. Thank, can I thank the member for Mirabuka for that question? Of course, last year, members, we introduced a number of reforms to help deliver an economic recovery to this state. A number of reforms were implemented, including the new pathway, the new streamlined pathway. And that was aimed to create more investment certainty, to ensure that we have better design buildings and, of course, to make sure we have a pipeline of work to allow us to get out of the economic, um, the potential economic turmoil that the state had, was facing. So far, 12 appointment uh, developments have been approved, representing $375 million in total investment, members, 2,000 construction and ongoing jobs. And member for South Perth, we were there at the sod turning of the first project being delivered under that new pathway out at 8 Parker Street in South Perth and the good Labor stronghold of South Perth members. It was, um, it was great to see the local um, landowners being involved in getting that project um, up and I'm so glad that we're delivering that new project. Since July, more than 70 applicants have expressed interest in accessing the pathway. Another 12 developments are now under consideration, worth more than a billion dollars and also um, thousands of new jobs. Projects that have been included include projects that have been approved include the State Football Centre in Queen's Park, Yay. Minister for Sport and Recreation, residential aged care facilities, the wharf extension at Henderson, student accommodation, multi-storey apartment buildings, and of course regional projects such as the LNG plant in Mount Magnet and a shopping centre in Dawesville. Members, this is all about making sure our economic recovery continues. Because our economic recovery doesn't stop today. It continues, members. And we need a pipeline of work, whether it be civil construction or whether it be um, business investment across the state. Now, we have the Liberal Party arguing that this new pathway should finish today, members. No. The Liberal Party believes that the economic recovery needs to finish now, that we could all wipe our hands and go home, members. The economic recovery has to continue. We need to continue a pipeline of projects, a pipeline of projects throughout the state to ensure we continue job opportunities and create economic opportunities. The member for Cottesloe came in yesterday arguing for public housing members. This is the member who opposes every development, every development across the state, who opposes multi-million dollar apartments because they are 21.2 metres on the street frontage and not 21 metres, members. This is what the member for Cottesloe does. Opposes every development. Well, to develop, deliver social housing, to deliver other housing, you need construction, you need development approvals, and that's what we'll continue to do. The member argued yesterday he wants more public housing in Cottesloe. Well, member, do you still subscribe to that? Oh, whereabouts, member? Whereabouts? Whereabouts? Oh, the southern part of Mosman Park. Is southern, southern part, southern part of Mosman, of Mosman Park, Park is perfect for redevelopment. Southern, po southern part of Mosman Park. So you want additional public housing? A additional, no, additional public housing. Additional pu public housing. Well, member, I'm, I'm glad to hear 
that, Member. I'm glad to hear that because we're implementing new housing opportunities across the state across the suburbs, and we'll be looking at continuing our economic recovery, creating jobs, and not listening to the Liberal Party, economic vandals who <laughs> believe economic recovery has finished, members. That's what they believe. Scrap the pathway. Let's all go home. Economic recovery is finished. We know it hasn't. We need to continue to create jobs and opportunities for the entire Western Australia. The member for Rowe. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Police. Minister, I refer to media reports regarding Hannah John, a registered midwife currently living in South Australia, who has accepted a contract with the Kalgoorlie Health Service and has reportedly had her G to G pass application rejected three times. And I ask, Minister, do you accept it would be more effective? <coughs> to have a transparent G2G assessment process which would allow essential workers like this to fill critical gaps. Uh, Madam Speaker. The Minister for Police. Oh, <clears throat> extraordinary. Uh, Madam Speaker, thank you. I thank the member for his question. Uh, only this morning, Member, I was meeting with the Police Commissioner and his team with respect to a, a range of issues, including Operation Tide, which is the uh, operation that supports uh, protecting our borders, defending Western Australia against COVID and uh, ensuring that we are the strongest and best place in the world for uh, people to live and for businesses to flourish. And uh, during that conversation, I, I asked the Commissioner about um, matters that have been raised in the media. Um, you would have probably heard beyond uh, Hannah's uh, story, uh, there's been a, a few call-ins to talk back where people <laughs> claim to have been uh, ringing from eastern states and you know, having difficulty with G2G. Uh, it was made very clear to me, and the Commissioner were, you know, this is an operational matter. It's a police operational matter. And I've got to say, they are doing an extraordinary job. Yeah. What, what a job <laughs> our Western Australian Police Force has done over the last 18 months or so. It, is, it has been world class. Um, it's undeniable the best uh, performing work police force in the nation, and poss possibly in the world, in regards to protecting us all against COVID. Uh, and the Commissioner pointed out to me that <coughs> regularly, and noting that there's been more than a, mi a, a million applications for uh, passes, uh, the vast majority of which are approved. Uh, there is an, a, a very big workload, and when they get them, they interrogate every single one of them because it's very important, it's vital for the safety of Western Australians that they inter interrogate every application. What has happened is regularly people uh, make application for G2G, the police request backing information. They request evidence. So it's one thing to, to make a claim that you're mentally unwell or you've got a job or, uh, or you're a Western Australian resident returning, uh, having been trapped in the East Coast in recent times, but you must provide evidence. And so if an individual makes an application, no matter how many times they make it, if they make it, every time it will be assessed, but if they don't provide the necessary backing documentation, then it will be rejected. And Honestly, I've got to say, I make no apologies for that. I don't think the police should apologise for that. They are defending our state. They are keeping us safe, and they are complying with the they are complying with the chief health officer's advice. They are complying with the chief health officer's advice. So, if you are asked to provide substantiation in form of documentation, you must do it. They, there are exemptions all the time for any number of reasons around uh, uh, people having confronting difficult circumstances, or in this case, if they've got a, if they've got work and, the, and uh, they've uh, got reason to come, then there are exemptions. But you must provide appropriate documentation. Supplementary question. Uh, thanks for your response, Minister. Minister, will the government consider updating the G2G pass processes to allow those West Australians who are fully vaccinated and have jobs lined up in critical sectors like health to be processed and approved in a quicker and clearer way? Madam, Minister, Madam please. Speaker, as, I, as I said, the vast majority of G2G passes are approved. And they're done, they are processed completely in accordance with the Chief Health Officer's advice. So we're not going to compromise that. That will never happen. But what I can ask 
I would ask through you uh, and at every opportunity, I would ask that people who are making applications comply with the request for documentation. At attach all of the information you require. Apparently, I'm told, I'm informed by the Commissioner, very frequently people will do nothing other than to show a driver's licence. You know, they take a photo of their driver's licence and attach that to their, their application. And because they've got a Western Australian driver's licence, they, they feel that that meets the obligation. It doesn't. You must provide necessary uh, documentation, talk to the police officers, seek out a conversation with the people assessing the application, and there are exemptions regularly. There are, the vast majority of G2G applications are approved. It is just that very frequently, apparently, people are not complying with some of the most basic requirements for, that are set by the Chief Health Officer, not by police. They've done a wonderful job. I commend them. I congratulate the Commissioner and his team and every police officer. There's some 408 dedicated to this task. Uh, and uh, they're out there on a daily basis defending the state for all of us. The member for Kalgoorlie. Madam Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Mines. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment. Sorry, Minister Talans. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, um, I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to same. It's same thing. We're doing we're doing fantastic work in that. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to creating regional jobs and support regional businesses by helping facilitate development of industrial land. And I ask, can the minister update the house on how this government is supporting the planning and development? of Lot 350 in Kalgoorlie, and can the Minister advise the House of anyone making misleading comments about the development of this industrial land? The Minister for Lands. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thought the member for Kalgoorlie had got the disease of the opposition when they asked questions of the wrong minister, but uh, I'm no. glad you got back on track. Now, Ka like Ka Kalgoorlie is obviously a mining town. It is obviously a mining town, I can understand. Oh, well, her favourite minister. Well, that's right, that's right. <laughs> So I thank, uh, I thank the member for a question. Uh, member, I'm very happy to report and advise the House that there's been some crucial steps made in the development of Lot 350 in Kalgoorlie, and thank you for the role that you've played uh, since you've been elected in March, an outstanding member for Kalgoorlie. So the progress has actually been excellent. So I was actually very, very surprised with some of the comments from a trio of embattled individuals, one being the embattled member from Mining and Pastoral, the Honourable Neil Thompson, one being the embattled Kalgoorlie CEO, John Walker, and the third is the so-called missing leader of the opposition, the member for Cottesloe. So can I just give you a bit of a quick history lesson, which I know that you're aware of, but uh, just for the rest of the, uh, the chamber in what we have done to create uh, job-moving um, um, uh, opportunities in your region. So it started with the state leasing lot uh, 500 in 2017. And the Minister for Mines, I can understand why you might be confused, because he's had a role to play. And the, um, the then Minister for Lands. And, and, the minister, and then Minister for Lands, right in front of me. So collective, collective uh, responsibility here. So as you know, that that's, uh, the lot three, uh, 500 is a block across the road from lot 350. And it was for a rare earth cracking and leaching plant, which is currently awaiting environmental approvals for development, which will bring 500 regional jobs in construction and 100 ongoing local jobs. And as you would know, uh, the city of Kalgoorlie failed to get traction for a number of years, and the proposed development of Lot 350 played out over 2020 and nearly 2021 until the March election with your elevation as the new member for Kalgoorlie and the work that you put in in regards to Lot um, 350. And as we know, Energy Oz, Energy Oz now have moved uh, in regard to that project, and we visited them at that site when I made a visit. Um, to Lot 350 earlier, uh, a couple of months ago now, I think. So following the recent election, we have approved freehold transfer, undertaken a business case soon to be considered by the board, granted early access to Energy Oz to do a site investigation, and co-currently preparing the stage one subdivision application. So I'm really, really surprised that 
On the Facebook of the Leader of the Opposition, who posts a number of, um, of photographs of, of the Liberal Party, the Leader of the Opposition of the Liberal Party, um, he has a number of photographs taken of himself and the member for mining pastor Neil Thompson around the goldfields outside our projects that he's canning. Like for this, this is actually Lock Tree, Lock Tree 50, Lock Tree 50, Lock Tree 50 yeah, member for Cottesloe. You, Lock Tree 50. That's uh, no, that's Lock 500. That's Lock 500. That's Lock 500. That's Lock 500. And then member, member for a uh, member of the opposition. I mean, uh, leader of the opposition. There you are. There you are with um, with the honourable Neil Thompson and the embattled mayor of. Uh, the the Badger CEO of Calgary, John Walker. But, hey, a member for Cottesloe, member, member for Cottesloe, member for Cottesloe. Minister, can I just, Besides, Minister, can I just be clear uh, that the photos you're holding up are actually of the Leader of the Liberal Party, not the Leader yeah, of the sorry, Opposition? Yeah, the Leader of the Liberal yep. Party. I, I keep forgetting the Liberal Party aren't the Opposition Party. There's only two members of this House. I keep forgetting that. It's really hard to get used to the fact that we have a sectarian, agrarian, socialist party as the Leader of the Opposition, the opposition Party, West Australia. Sorry, I meant, I meant the Leader of the Liberal Party, the member for Cottesloe. So, as you know, as you know, um, um, member for Cottesloe, we live in a COVID-19 COVID pandemic situation. As you also know, we are the safest jurisdiction in Australia. Why are we the safest jurisdiction in Australia? Could we have a Premier, a Deputy Premier, we have a Cabinet, we have a community that complies with the health advice of the Chief Health Officer. We are, we are a very compliant state. We comply with rules when it comes to masks. We comply with social distancing. So I want to know... Sorry, point of order. The relevance of this, this whole line of answer that we're receiving from the minister it doesn't seem to have any relevance to the question asked whatsoever. So, I, I ask that you agree on the matter of look, evidence. I, um, look, I hear and decide on the points of order, and uh, I. It's my understanding that the minister is making a rather lengthy analogy, um, which I'd ask him to draw to a conclusion and maybe wind up his answer, uh, so that we've got the opportunity for a couple more questions before Thank I close speaker. question time. The question from the member of Kalgoorlie talked about misleading statements, and uh, in respect to misleading the public and treating the whole issue of COVID-19 compliance as a joke, the honourable Neil Thompson has a photo downplaying and joking about not putting a mask on properly no. on Facebook. So, leader of, the opposite, leader, of, leader of the Liberal Party, are you going to be like, are you going to be like your leader in New South Wales, as the Premier referred to, who had no backbone, who had no backbone and is causing a crisis for the rest of Australia, while well, you are going to censor, are you going to censor the Honourable Neil Thompson? That is a disgraceful disgraceful post. How can you stand there and defend a situation like that? You are a joke, you lack backbone, and you're only currently the leader of the Liberal Party. When I, do you agree with that post? 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 So, I, I, member for Cottesloe, Member Cottesloe, do you agree with that? Do you agree with that post? Uh, thank you, Minister. I think you've made your point as well. If I can uh, ask the leader of the Liberal Party for the next question. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, and I know this minister will give a proper answer. My minister, uh, my question is to the minister for police. I refer to the lack of trans. <laughs> I am extremely confident after the Clown Act we just heard. I refer to the lack of transparency. I refer to the lack of transparency in the G2G -G process, leaving Western Australians stranded on the East Coast who have been repeatedly denied G2G -G passes. Even if they are even if they are vaccinated, live and work in this state and in some cases need to return home for medical reasons. And I ask, and this is a key part to the question if you care to listen, members, will you... Uh, members, 
I'm not sure if you'd like question time to run for the rest of the afternoon or whether you want me to cut it short, but we are not going to be able to progress if I get incessant interjections throughout the opposition questions. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Minister, will you introduce a transparent review process for rejected applications for G2G passes? If not, will you provide the House with the rationale behind your unwillingness to make this change and be upfront with the WA public? Madam the Speaker. Minister for Police and the Minister for Police only, please. Madam Speaker, thank you. I thank the member for his question. Member, the G2G pass criteria are set by the Chief Health Officer. The police apply the rules as directed, as indicated and, and uh, confirmed by the Chief Health Officer. They go via a directive and they apply them. When we shut down a border, it's all done legally. It is all done in accordance with the process that has been established since uh, COVID was, uh, you know, first uh, confronted us all last year. There's nothing, nothing has changed other than the threat of Delta has meant that some jurisdictions have been uh, had increased threat levels uh, placed upon them and as a consequence our border has been hardened. I don't think that is a bad thing. I think it's a good thing that our border is hardened. I think it's a good thing that our police are rigorous in pursuing the uh, requirements of the Chief Health Officer in protecting the state and I refuse to even contemplate uh, contradicting that process which has served us so well to date. What I will re repeat though, I'll, I'll say again and I'll ask that you convey this to anyone who uh, contacts you mistakenly thinking that that is worth doing, um, I would ask that you do this. Ask them to comply with the requests by the police for documentation, whatever they ask for in terms of justification because as I'm informed by the police commissioner only a couple of hours ago, it is a regular occurrence, not incredibly regular. There, most people comply. The vast majority of G2G applications are approved. Occasionally, some people are rejected and instead of changing their application to comply with the request for information, they reapply without any change to their application. Contact the police, talk to them about what's required, read the emails that you receive or the messages you receive and comply with the request for documentation that confirms whatever claim that you are making. And then it is very likely that you'll be given an exemption and you will be able to travel. Thank you. Supplementary question. The uh, Leader of the Liberal Party Thank you very much. Minister, the question was about transparency of the process. What was the rationale behind the recent decision to allow a multi-millionaire hedge fund founder who entered WA from the UK being, and I quote news.com, allowed to skip out on mandatory hotel quarantine after three days to attend his father's funeral? And, but why are ordinary Western Australians on the East Coast with the same pause being barred from returning home at all? Madam Speaker. So, um, Madam Speaker. I'm not, just before, uh, with the supplementaries, I'm not sure how many warnings I need to give you, um, but I'm, my patience is wearing thin. You, you've really introduced new material into your supplementary, which you're not supposed to do. Yeah. But I'll ask the Minister to so, respond. Uh, Madam Speaker, as you know, Member, um, the international borders is the responsibility of the federal government. And uh, the federal government allowed that individual to return to Australia. That aside, I, I, it is very disappointing that you appear to be determined to undermine our capacity to defend Western Australia against COVID. You are undermining... You, are appear, you, appear, determined, you appear determined to undermine confidence in our system, which has served us so well. Can I, can I point out, just with respect to that individual, it's an operational matter, it's controlled by the police. I wouldn't have a clue as to why that individual uh, you know, is, was managed in the way he was. But what I can confirm is he went straight back into hotel quarantine. So there is no such thing as an individual being allowed to skip out. Uh, I am aware in this case, because it's been in the media, that when he uh, attended the funeral, he was 40 metres away from all of his family and the people who were attended the funeral. It's, I know, it's, a, it's, it's pretty low. It's pretty low that you would choose to... That you would choose to... To, uh, under <laughs> it's pretty low that you would choose this particular matter, an individual attending a funeral. That aside... You're stopping other Western Australians doing it. Can I just thank the Minister for Police for his excellent answer? It's very clear to me. Uh, and perhaps I could ask the member for Swan Hills to move on to the next question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the vote of confidence.
this myth of willogy. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a serious question. Um, my, my question without notice. <clears throat> My question without notice is to the Minister for Emergency Services, and I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to reducing the risk of bushfire to local communities across Western Australia, and I ask, can the Minister update the House on this government's significant investment in bushfire mitigation measures, and can the Minister outline to the House what this record investment means for bushfire-prone communities across WA? The Minister for Emergency Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I can, I can do that, uh, Member for Swan Hills. And can I um, just thank you and congratulate you for your excellent advocacy and hard work for your constituents, especially after a very tough year with the Wooroloo impacting largely in your electorate. What you have done over the past few months has been extraordinary. It's been very tough, uh, and I thank you for what you've done. Um, the, uh, this gives me an opportunity, uh, Member, to explain what the government is doing in terms of bushfire mitigation, which you obviously will have a special uh, interest in. Uh, more than 90 per cent of our state members is bushfire prone, and over the past five years we have invested a record $50 million in mitigation that includes $35 million for mitigation on Crown land. Now, it's the first time that DFES has performed this important work. And we also secured $15 million for the Bushfire Risk Management Planning Program to support local governments identify and then treat bushfire risk. So our state is actually entering a new era of enhanced bushfire management the likes of which we've not seen before. Uh, and this funding is making a real difference. We're seeing more planned burning and other mitigation activities. Uh, since 2017, the McGowan government has invested $31 million of funding that, is that has been provided to 48 local governments across the state. And that's meant 4,306 potentially life and property saving bushfire mitigation treatments across more than 9,000 hectares and more than 4,700 kilometres, 4,700 kilometres of upgraded fire breaks and fire access roads to reduce the threat of disastrous bushfires. And just weeks ago, members, uh, 26 additional local governments shared a record of $7.5 million in mitigation activity funding for more than 1,100 mitigation activities in high bushfire risk areas. And this includes mechanical treatments to reduce fuel levels, uh, the creation of fire breaks and planned burns. Now, Members, we know where the uh, the party of the region, the true party of the regions, and I've got a long list of local governments, local governments that have uh, benefited from this mit mitigation funding, and I can go through the list. Uh, and and as I look through the list, uh, they, they they seem to be all Labor seats, but we share the responsibility across some of the few remaining non-Labor seats in there, in, there, in across the state. Uh, I can see Pilbara, I can see uh, Warren Blackwood, Collie Preston, uh, there's Vass there, Vass. Uh, Moore, Moore is, is included, Member for Moore, you'll be glad to know that. You'll be glad to at least know the McGowan government is looking after the constituents of Moore, even if the local member isn't. Uh, so it's true to say we've done more for Moore than ever before, Member. <laughs> As I, look through, as I look through the list, the member for Roe, you're not forgotten about. We haven't, seen, we haven't said no to Roe either. Uh, uh, we're, you're all there. But this is a... Uh, but, but members, members it, has been, it has been a very difficult year. We've had uh, Wooroloo and Red Gully bushfires. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, issues that our firefighters and first responders have had to uh, attend to. Uh, our emergency services continue to work harder than they ever had be have before. They can't do it by themselves. Uh, and we can't stop every bushfire, but what we can do is reduce the impact of when that fire occurs. And as the member for uh, Swan Hills well knows, that a prepared community is a safer community. Thank you. Um, just before I give the last question, I think I saw the former member for the Kimberley, Carol Martin, walk in. But I Yes, she's here. Uh, welcome, Carol. Uh, and the last question uh, to the member for Roy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Sport and Recreation. 
I refer to the current discussions with the AFL regarding hosting the AFL Grand Final at Optus Stadium and I ask, can you provide an update on how these discussions are progressing and are you undertaking proactive steps to ensure WA footy fans don't miss out on this opportunity? Madam the Speaker. Minister. Thank you, Member Perot, for your question. Um, as you would have, um, of, course, of course, read in the papers, uh, discussions have been had. The AFL is keen, obviously, if possible, uh, as us being a possible destination for the finals. Our, as the Premier said, as the Deputy Premier said, as, as I will say, we very much hope the situation gets under control in Victoria and that the grand final traditionally, which is held at the MCG, continues to be held there. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens. Um, if it is held in WA, it'd be great to see the doctors playing the grand final after the stadium. <laughs> No, I, was, I thought that was a good answer to to, to the last line. Uh, supplementary. <laughs> Minister, I can't I can't agree with that last um, section. But um, given given WA successfully hosted uh, the recent um, Dreamtime match very well, um, are you advocating for Perth to host the entire? AFL final series series potentially? Uh, Minister. As you said, we did uh, successfully uh, um, manage the uh, Dreamtime game here. And the fact that we, the fact that we can have major games here and that we can be in the picture for AFL finals is because of the leadership of this government in controlling the COVID-19 situation. And I'll tell you one place where the finals won't be held, it's New South Wales. So it's about time you got on the phone, rather than talking to Clyde Palmer, you got on the phone to the Premier of New South Wales and tell her to come and have a look at what we're doing in WA. Thank you. Uh, members. Members. Leader of the House. Members. No, I'm not giving you the call. I'm asking you to. I'm calling you to order. Um, <laughs> message uh, number 15 from the Legislative Council. The Legislative Council acquaints the Legislative Assembly that it has agreed to the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021 without amendment. On Elena Clossy. And message number 16, the Legislative Council equates the Legislative Assembly. It has agreed to the Railway BBI Rail Oz Proprietary Limited Agreement Bill 2021 without amendment. Uh, government business.